first and foremost, a gigantic welcome back, my brother. Great to have you on again. So nice to talk with you again. Dang. And really cool to have you on the show. As uh, It's been a few years now since I think, uh, actually, we had you on a couple years ago by phone, but it's been a few years since we last saw you when, when you and Dewey were here. I guess it was 2017. Um, well, it's uh, long overdue, as I'm sure you know. Yes, but, uh, totally, totally. I, I would love to see that on the schedule. Well, hopefully we can eventually make that happen. And uh, you're part of this series that we're doing, Jerry. We've been doing this series called Off the Road. We're connecting with artists around the world during the pandemic. And uh, before we get to the record, just a few setup questions to kind of set the stage. First question we always ask folks is, where are you now? And is this where you've been since the crisis started? Um, I am in Sydney, Australia. And my wife and I have a lovely home here in a suburb called Paddington, which is you know, pretty near the city center. And uh, we split no, on a normal schedule. We split our time between here and a little place in Venice, California. I have been here since the middle of April. We were on the road uh, March. We had just actually flown out to start a tour, I think March 10 or 11, when you know everything hit the fan. And we, along with the entire industry, flew home. And I did five weeks in our L.A. home uh, in lockdown and food deliveries and that whole drill. And by that point, we realized that nothing was going to be coming back within the next few months. And I should get over here where my wife is and I have, I have stepkids and stuff here. So um, by that point, Australia was a closed uh, country, island nation. So for me to come here, it was apparent I would have to do two weeks of hotel quarantine. I was only allowed in because I am married to an Australian. Uh, basically, the country is closed to people coming in or leaving. In fact, Australians are not allowed to leave. So um, I came up uh, April 19th, did two weeks, came out May 1st, and have been here ever since. Wow, what a neat story in some ways that's different than because uh, we've had stories from people are just all over the place, everything from like John McLaughlin and Monaco to uh, cats who are in uh, London with Steve Hackett from Genesis was on from London and uh, Moody Blues cat was in Florida people trapped in different places because of the sure. of the thing sure. and, and for you now it started you were on the road take us back to where it was when you were playing that you can remember the first yeah. the first times when like a manager or somebody said hey the show isn't going to happen or something weird's going on fill, fill in the story from there well, we, as you as you know, Dave, we do about 100 shows a year, every year. And uh, last year was no exception. We were in the middle of a 50th year celebration. Uh, and, and in many ways, a, a year unlike any other, or not unlike any other. We were out on the road doing a, And this takes us all over the world. We happened uh, in the middle of March to be, we had just landed. We'd been home for a, three or four days. And we just landed in West Virginia hmm. to start what was going to be a two-week bus run. But prior to that, the news had been, you know, coming out since at least January. And I remember a month or so, we, in fact, played a rock cruise early February. And, you know, that was obviously one of the uh, real areas of concern that people can bind on cruise ships. Anyway, we were all very fortunate and healthy. We then went to New York and did three shows in the New York area. This was all pre-social distancing and, and or any of that. But I do remember... Um, carrying you know uh purell and stuff with us and wiping down the plane and stuff so it was really quite a quite a situation even before everything shut down we were doing you know we we're doing shows every weekend and i remember we had one show with the, the buckinghams don't really know the buckinghams but you know dewey and i were huge fans of theirs <clears throat> back from the start but there was all of this kind of elbowing each other that backstage and stuff because it has clearly was starting to be a an issue and when there was three things that happened on March 10 or 11, one was that Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson tested positive. Coincidentally, Tom and Rita were here in Australia. Right. And um, that was a worldwide story because now it was clear that, you know, um, nobody was immune from this. Uh, the NBA had a uh, an outbreak and canceled in one day the entire season. So that was obviously big. And the other thing was I think Europe immediately closed its borders so it was you know talk about flicking the big switch i coincidentally uh rita is a good friend of ours and was performing here in sydney and my wife went to see rita at the opera house which turned into being a bit of a cluster 
uh, she was supposed to go backstage and and chat and stuff and they met we messed up the phone numbers or something and the point is that they didn't hook up but it was a bit of a bit of a gift because a lot of the people in that concert got sick wow and that was at the sydney opera house is that what you said it was yeah she was doing a rita is a fantastic singer as you as you might know and right. and we've been friends for years and um she does sh tour she's i mean a lot of the venues that we play performing arts centers you can see she's on the schedule either having been or coming and uh so she was down here tom was i don't know if you remember the story but he was just here he was here to start filming a biopic um that baz lerman is directing on the life of elvis presley and colonel tom parker and tom was playing tom parker and then immediately shut that film down you know that was a hundred million dollar production at least and so the enormity of what we were up against uh, we didn't need to look far to get examples no totally that's that's a lot of stuff there very interesting story from you so far and you were in so you were in uh you yourself west virginia, west virginia yeah. and that's when and that gig just got blown out that night kind of deal or when we landed i remember having a conversation with my manager and said i you know i know we're getting on this plane but i have this thing called a calculator and when i use this calculator <laughs> i think i think we're were screwed basically the numbers that i enter meaning just simple math about how quickly it was spreading and he said well at the moment all the shows are on so we of course you have to show up and then when all of these things these three shoes as i say drop right. you know three um the the first gig we couldn't just start to select and go oh well west virginia has low numbers we'll play here but we won't go play in miami or something that was in a pro that would have been inappropriate so I remember the, the, the poor lady that promoting the West Virginia show was sold out. And she said, it's mostly all college kids. It's not an elderly audience. We should be safe. And we explained that, unfortunately, that's not how this works. You can't just cherry pick and, and say, we felt okay about that one. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody, to cut some slack, everybody was trying to adjust. To this, po to this day, it's still going on. You know, there are the groups like ourselves that have a pretty full schedule for the rest of the year and we're just watching and waiting and seeing that uh, because everybody you know it has been a it's been a long year for all of us and, uh, oh yeah well that's why we call it the series off the road and we've had so many different kinds of we started it last april with jack johnson and have been going since with just all kinds of folks and lots of them have explained even how the booking works that you got to keep dates on on tap and then you keep them as long as you can and then when it's when it's time to bump them and postpone them to a later date you kind of do that um yeah, and uh pretty, hmm? it's a common dynamic and and uh for ourselves and i tell you 90 some percent of the musicians that are out on tour you don't have a tour that's just arranged by live nation where you make one phone call you know and and, and it's all done if you have 50 shows coming up that's 50 different promoters and each one has a different idea of what they think they can do or can't do and unfortunately if you just blanket cancel uh you know you're responsible you're now legally responsible for canceling gigs so you get into this unfortunate bit of a waiting game and just see because nobody wants to do some, I don't think, wants to do anything that's unsafe. Uh, but, uh, you know, the kind of, oh, time will tell. We all kind of hung around in the, well, when there's a vaccine, you know, that was a lovely kind of caveat to the whole thing. And now we do have vaccines, and it's obviously not quite as simple as we're good, you know. Right. I was going to say, you should put on your list, I've been chatting with Will Lee, who was, um, you know, Paul Schaefer's bass player for all of those years. Uh, in the Letterman band, right, and he has a great group called the Fab Fo, uh, Fab Fo, um, which is a Beatle tribute band, and they're fantastic. Anyway, he is married to a French lady, and they were in Saint Bart's for a few months, and now they're in the south of France. So, if you really want to chat with somebody who's, you know, kind of got a unique story I, I can connect you with him oh that's cool i mean that's neat that i you're right and it's so so many different places have slightly different rules and sometimes people have found a way to to make certain things work i forget who was telling us like kenny wayne shepherd maybe it was dave mason who actually was telling us how some country artists were doing like bull rings and sort of outdoor rodeo venues and different kinds of people were trying different tactics to still go out and make a buck um and drive-ins were a thing there were a few right. drive-in beach boys did some uh, car shows and right yeah you know everybody's doing what you can it's an interesting dynamic uh apart from the tragic 
reality of all the health issues and economic and stuff. But it's fascinating to watch people kind of try to adjust and and I'm sure you've been seeing there's a lot of uh, a lot of Zoom concerts and things. Yeah, I mean the, the online thing has been massive with the shows, and and that's hard for people I think to really get into. That's what, like the interviews is a little bit easier to do because there's so many of them occurred remotely to begin with. Um, but it seems like it's been harder to really get people to connect with the the shows, as I've heard from a number of both fans and musicians, because there's just so much video already out there, and it's hard to hard to convince yourself. Oh, this is happening live so i need to watch sure. it now um or god god forbid to pay for it you know you right. got so much stuff at your you know like who wants to pay that exactly oh, I see. it's not just open to go view you've got to sign up and you know it's kind of like they did with fights and things pay-per-view right exactly no and 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 it doesn't necessarily transfer quite as well as something like a, a fight oh, a, a fighter <laughs> there's a there's quite, quite a quite an experience about the experience that's you know, right you know that's the whole point of going you know it's like the rubbing shoulders and yeah and up and stuff around i saw a thing on the uh, you know some attempts at a socially distant concert distance concert and it was like you know there's got to be three seats in between you and everybody's got to wear a mask and there will be no standing <laughs> oh god right <laughs> this this model needs a little work yeah it's it, it's going to take as you said it's going to take some and as other cats have uh have said it's going to take some time uh, and we'll come back to shows later in the interview and talk a little more about that but when you mentioned the the other side of this which we haven't talked about is the the deeper um the trauma of it all and throughout the uh series that we've had we have mentioned some of the musical luminaries who have been lost to COVID-19 and different artists have different connections to different people just based on their experience. And as, as it turns out, since this thing began, we've ended up getting a lot about some of the artists, uh, Manu Dibango, Ellis Marsalis, father of the Marsalis musicians, John Prine, Toots Hibbert of Toots and the Maytals, all, all, we've lost them all to COVID. And there's another guy, and I've mentioned him to so many different cats. And, and, and as I said, some people have connections to people and some don't. And so there's one dude who we lost who I've mentioned a lot of folks and nobody really had, had gotten to work with him. And ironically, you had, and that's Adam Schlesinger of Fountains of Wayne. Yeah worked yeah. closely with you guys share some stories of how he got connected to the band and what you guys did together kind of kind of remember him a bit well thank you for bringing him up because uh, his memory is of course um, still first and foremost in our minds because we were very close and and not that anybody needs a reminder but uh, to have such a tragic consequence so early on in this thing was a, a lesson for all of us who knew him adam was 52 no pre-existing conditions and he was gone within 10 days or two weeks. Um, Adam was a member of Fountains of Wayne, which was uh, and is one of Dewey and my favorite bands. Um, but he was also an amazingly talented independent music producer. I knew of Adam's work years and years ago. My son and I used to bond over Utopia Highway and some of the earlier Fountains of Wayne stuff. We just loved it. And through a friend, I can't remember who, I started an email correspondence with him many years ago and we used to swap songs and i was sending him some stuff and one of them i caught his ear and he wrote back and he said you know i'm producing now with james eha who is the fantastic um ex smashing pumpkins guitarist and they had a production company and a studio in new york and he says why don't you come and we'll we'll cut some of this if you can and i said oh, that'd be fantastic <laughs> so it went up a notch and i was now in new york working with him and at that point, because there were, you know, very learned people who were kind of, you got to keep Adam on your radar because the guy is never wasting his time. He's always working on something. Um, when Sony heard about it, they said, well, that sounds like something we'd be very interested in. So it went from just kind of me and Adam writing together to an America project. And Dewey was familiar with the band. He didn't have far to go to get up to speed on this. But it quickly went within a year from just me working with a you know kind of a mutual admiration to we've now got a deal with sony and this is going to be a major release so we did the album here and now which is to this day one of my favorite experiences and i have lots of as you know they have lots of lovely recording experiences years working with george martin etc but that that project with adam and james was right up there at the top and i think i learned as much from adam in in that year or two as i did from george in many years that's not a 
a knock on George's amazing abilities, but it's just and try to impress upon people how talented Adam was. He, you know, behind the scenes, he did the music for things like that thing, that thing you do, the, um, the great Tom Hanks rock and roll right. movie. movie. And when we started recording with him, he was wrapping up the soundtrack, the music and lyrics, a Hugh Grant, Drew Barrymore rom-com kind of thing. He did a lot of the writing for um, Colbert and stuff. Colbert was doing a special Christmas back in the days of the Colbert Report. Um, Adam was the go-to guy. To, to He's just an incredibly talented guy. And uh, there, you, there you have it. You know, this is somebody that was not elderly, was not overweight, whatever, the, you know, these pre-existing conditions. And he was gone, obviously, way too soon. That's a great record too. That here and now, that that live version of uh, Sandman that's on that thing is just so ferocious. Um, and uh, the uh, right, like one of the, there's a bunch of tasty live tracks on there. Real good. Yeah, we did we did a um, parallel album that included a lot of the hits from a live performance and stuff, which was a great idea because you know nowadays you're going to sell twice as many if it's an America product that has those titles on it as well, even if you're desperate to unveil some new material yeah yeah i get that idea to try to lure people in well that was a tasty one for sure and uh when was the last time that you talked with him or saw him well right before in fact you know i i don't know if you know but i've been a kind of a side photographer for the last 20 over 20 years and part of what i would shoot is every day i would shoot a picture out of my wherever i was and it was it started early as a um kind of a way to tell friends and family I could email them this picture and here's where I am today and of course you're moving every day but uh that morphed into instead of just a view out of my hotel just a view in my wa I walk around the city so in New York we were there in February and I sent a um picture out and he immediately called wrote back and said you were right at my that's my office oh, wow. so some street shot that I had taken in Chelsea or in the meatpacking district happened to be where Adam had set up his business. The studio had closed and he had a production company. Um, and so we then chatted and it was a plan to, he was in great shape and and um, let's have a coffee. And we were staying down in, in Soho and he said, well, I'll come by there. And then got a message says, I'm backed up here. I'm sorry, can we do it the next time, day? And we were leaving the next day. So it was a back and forth chat and texts that we just left it at that and uh, within a month he was gone wow that's um that's heavy that's a great a way to at least have remembered him because so many cats have not uh and i knew getting into this with you that um this would be the guy that you would have the um because yeah. i'm i interviewed you back then when that record came out many many years ago and and uh that's that's sad and like you said the cat didn't have any kind of conditions that would uh and then you hear that sometimes you, i remember reporting on the show as you know i host all things considered so there's a bunch of news that's a big bigger part of what we do than than the music stuff i remember a guy who's 104 had it got into a hospital and was released you know he got over it and then you hear about cats like adam or even younger there was a, a congressman i remember he was like 41 so um yeah that you know um, and in this case, the earliest cases, you know, it was a uh, trial and error thing. And there were so many intub intubated um, it, situations where, you know, when you're dealing with a lung, you know, the lung issues like this, that was just the plan. And a lot of people put on these machines and didn't come out. You know? Right. And the machine itself, yeah. we learned, is a very stressful endeavor. Just getting onto that yeah. thing is not exactly, yeah. you really want to save that for when when you need it and uh and john prine is that not i just think sty stylistically and i could be completely off my off uh, out of my mind with that but i was just thinking had he ever had any connection to you guys well there's a lovely just to go all the way back it's one of my i, I use this as an example because people always say well it must have been amazing at that era or you and dewey were in england in the late 60s and, and i use for example the we won a grammy in 72 for best new artist which was of course a fantastic honor and just that in itself is a great story but more important i like to mention that the nominees <laughs> that year you want to know how rich and deep the music that coming out in the world was at that time the nominees for best new artist <clears throat> this is not record of the year this is these were new that year it was america loggins and messina <laughs> the eagles 
Harry Chapin, and John Prine. Wow. That was one year of Best New Artist. So, you know, I'm, it's an honor, and we won that particular Grammy, or the Grammy goes to, but uh, it just shows you how deep and rich um, it was, was the talents coming out at that at that time in the 70s. No, no question. And, uh, wow, that's a great link there, too. And, um and as we turn uh, to the record here, uh, and also what a weird, uh, not weird, but a very ironic kind of uh, name for the album, which probably doesn't have anything to do with the crisis, but it just kind of evokes hope. Keeping the, li keeping the light on. Um, yeah, it kind of fit by accident. Yeah, right, exactly. I was going to say it's like accidental appropriate sort of thing. And, and you've done eight solo records just in the past 26 years um and this is a, a best of jerry beckley it's called keeping the light on explain for fans exactly what's on this one including that track norman which is part of five previously unreleased ones well it's always a good idea to put some things that even the, the deepest of fans you know might won't have and so that was going to be a part of the plan from the start and as you know i mean these these solo albums have come out in, in between, in the gaps of what is already a very busy schedule with Dewey and the touring and, and stuff. Not so much recording now, which allowed me the time when I was home. I've always had a, a studio at home, <clears throat> which allowed me to amass material on, and, and in every few years put out a solo record. Um, the, uh, the challenges are different. You know, it's not a democracy. I've only got myself to please if there's a cover or two that I want to do. You know, it's I'm my, I'm my own boss. I can do it. But I've enjoyed these projects over the years. And I've been with a lovely small boutique label called Blue Alain for the last five years. And and they had approached me about doing this kind of a summation best of. And the title, there's a song called Keeping the Light On, which is where that comes from. But it's um, there's a few people that I send all this stuff out to and who I, are friends and I respect their ears and stuff. And one is Cameron Crowe, who is, you know, as known for his musical ones, you know, the scores and the soundtracks for his films, as he is for the great history of the movies that he's made. But he'd always said to me, oh, that's my favorite, you know, I love that song. And so I thought, oh, that's good. And it'd be a nice, nice title for a, for a collection of songs anyway. Oh, it's a great title, and uh, and that's cool um, that that it comes through him. And so there's also, according to the press release for this, and we kind of mentioned your your photo side, and we've talked about it before, actually, in previous interviews. But it says here, photos from Jerry's private collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I don't really, I don't uh, post. I, I do now have an Instagram side, Jerry Beckley Music, which is. You know, long overdue, but far more of a kind of a promotional thing for for projects and stuff than it is. Here's an insight into Jerry's personal life. But um, when I did, and I've been shooting for years now, but it would go out to a an actual limited number of friends and family that I would email to. And of course, when all of the social media kicked in, I was told every other day of my life, God, you really ought to be on Instagram or Facebook. These are perfect. <laughs> and I'd say, well, the, my point is that it's personal. I don't really want to announce to the world that I'm in Des Moines and here's where I'm staying. You know, it's, I thought, I thought the, the, one of the pluses about it was its exclusivity. So, you know, um, that's kind of you know how it came about but but it has turned into a huge body of work for better or worse i you know i have as you know dave i have some dear friends who are what i call real photographers henry diltz is one of my closest friends and, and uh, there's a lovely man in venice california called glenn lutchford who's one of the top fashion photographers in the world and so i'm a little hesitant to tout the whole photo thing when you when you know some people who really know what they're doing that's so funny you mentioned henry because one of the uh because i got to put little photo credits for all the guests in the series and he did somebody maybe it was jimmy webb he's he's photographed some of the cats uh yeah it's so far in the thing that's just so funny all your all your connections uh, probably probably was jimmy webb they're very close yeah that's who i think uh i think it was it was, a, it was a ways back and and this thing also bonus cd with covers of your songs by contemporary yeah. indie artists yeah that's that came about kirk passick who's the um creator of the label said i don't know what you think about this idea but i've you know it started with um fantastic uh, chelsea williams today 
her name is Chelsea Williams, did a fantastic version of Sister Golden Hair. And, and right away, um, Chris Doritas picked it up. And it's been in heavy rotation ever since. And so they've made a parallel release of all of these artists doing some of my songs. And it's, you know, I'm not worthy and all the usual comments, but they, it's so interesting because each one's a different artist different producer so there's some very different takes it isn't like let's all do a you know acoustic harmony version of jerry's tunes there's some very creative things no it's cool no it's nice that you and you're right so many different and it goes back to what we were saying about the here and now record with the uh cats from uh the pumpkins and the fountains of wayne who were both uh sure. interested in in the band so the band has had this renaissance for a while where younger cats are tuned into uh the sounds that that you've been doing now turning through all of this where has your partner in america dewey bennell been throughout this this crisis well his journey is uh, as interesting frankly as mine and in a sense quite predictable like mine we both have you know two homes in our life and mine is between venice and sydney australia and dewey's is between uh, rancho palace verdes in la and uh, northern wisconsin his wife is from Wisconsin and they have a beautiful home on an incredibly uh, picturesque lake. And they spend all summer, every summer there. And Dewey works out of Wisconsin, flies out of Rhinelander. And, and so it's, it's not summers off, but that's their base. And they, they have a huge menagerie of animals and they have a horse. And so it's a big thing to move everybody over there up to the, to the lake come I, I don't know, April or May, they do that and start. So, he kept that plan in place and they went and they were in kind of lockdown very similar to how they would have spent a regular summer without the weekend flights off to do the shows you know uh he's now back he came back in september or october i think as the weather turns up there it gets quite cold and so brings everybody home and he has been based in la in the south bay there since and has just got his second shot he's got a got to his two vaccinations and uh they're doing well. We, we, we text all the time, as you can imagine. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask that. How often do you speak with, how often do you actually talk? You text every day and how often do you yeah, text? Yeah, it's texting, it's texting much more than talking. But my wife, you know, we love the Benells as, as a couple. And so we're always trying to schedule a FaceTime. It's one of those things, <laughs> as you probably know, when we had a Zoom meeting with all the band and, and crew and everything, and we were all on this Zoom. It was so great to see everybody. And we said, oh, this is great. We should do this every week. And, you know, a few months pass. And we, you know, what happened? <laughs> yeah. I know what you're talking about. Totally, brother. Human nature oh, yeah. is what you're talking yeah, about. Yes, how it goes. That's well, so you're talking to him a bunch. Well, that's good. Well, when next time you're texting, say, hey, that guy out in Hawaii was asking about you. He sends, he yeah. Sends well, how, how about you and there? You know, I've got quite a few friends in the island. That's been a that's been a real roller coaster too. It has. Um, I mean, we've had the lower case numbers probably because of our ice. You know, we're not connected to any place, so there's a, there's a that adds to the uh, insulation or whatever has kept us to have much much lower uh, deaths and case numbers, and it it got out of like everywhere else. It went up, it went down, it went up, it went down, um, but always was on a more muted. Uh, basis yeah. than thankfully than than what everybody else has had um but certainly um it had being here we don't have you know we're dependent on people coming so without sure. the, without the uh when they used to get i think the the number is thirty five thousand visitors a day used to yeah. come and now they get i think five or six thousand or something like that and and you even kind of got to look at it a little funny like who who like you need people to come here but at the same time it's kind of like who is coming here right now you know it's just yeah it's, and then, and where do they stay the hotels i mean do they do they close down half the floors of each hotel I, I, they, I don't know yeah. how they do that in the hotels but it's the same that's just that that represents the feeling i always have is like one i wouldn't get on the plane to come here and then when you get here you got to stay yeah like the whole thing to me like i appreciate the, it's just, it's like we're all on our own trips and everybody has a different way of looking at things. But just for myself, I'm, I always just cringe. Like, I wouldn't even think of going somewhere right now. But, but when you ask, right. I mean, Hawaii needs people. So we're kind of in that bind. It's like, yeah. It's like, well, we, that's why I ask. You know, uh, you might know that uh, along with New Zealand, the Australian numbers are astoundingly low. It's an island nation and yeah. it completely sh that shut down both ways in and out. 
So as a result, um, Sydney is in the state of New South Wales. Um, yep. Uh, um, Melbourne is in the state of Victoria. You know, they have states like the states. But we have had 28 straight days in New South Wales of no new cases. Unbelievable. Zero. Zero, you know, in a city of millions of people. And so it's a reminder of, okay, well, it, it truly is. I say to my wife, it's like a Truman Show kind of bubble. Um, but there is a price to pay. You know, Melbourne has three times this year locked down severely, you know. Nobody can go out. Uh, all all shops and restaurants closed. But here in New South Wales, we've been really, really fortunate. Do you wear a mat? Do you go out and do stuff, or do you do you stay in? We do. Well, we have, and that has come and gone. Restaurants were doing half capacity and stuff. But um, the joke is, with the movie theaters, the movies we go see, nobody goes to see anyway. All of these foreign <laughs> films, of theaters are empty. But um, yes, we did for a while. Masks were mandatory indoors. Um, public transport but there's a very few masks to be for full disclosure because there's just absolutely no cases wow um, well how wild you're the first cat in this entire series who says anything like that because i knew it would be different there so you're saying to me jerry just to get this right you go out on the street you're walking around in sydney australia and you mm -hmm. don't wear a mask and other people aren't wearing them either i'll have a mask in my pocket at all times mm -hmm. if we're taking an uber the driver will have a mask. It's the first thing we do before we get in the car. But beyond that, now, for weeks when there might have been, like, say there was a cluster. And when I say cluster, I mean that there were six positive cases in a particular area in Sydney. And they would lock that area. They call that area a red zone. You're not allowed to drive in or out. And then we were mandatory to wear a mask if you were going into the supermarket or something. But in general, no, there's very few. Masks. Wow. What a different scene than what uh, than what we're going through. And you mentioned that Dewey got his double. He's hit both shots of his vaccination. And, and forgive me, yeah. you, you may have said yours. I can't remember. What's your status? I on haven't. In fact, and w because there wasn't quite the panic here, the the um, the whole ramp up for vaccinations is a month or two behind. Having said that. They're now getting a little bit of flack because the rest of the world is clearly logging millions of vaccinations. And so there's a bit of foot to the floor to move it forward. They are starting next Tuesday. And uh, there's only 25 million people in the entire country. So they're hoping by this, by our U.S. summer to have everybody who wants a shot. I would like to get a, a shot here before I come back because if and when uh, our musical career kicks back into gear, I'd rather have been vaccinated here than get over to the States. But as it is so much easier to get a shot, they haven't even started here. It wow. might turn into a month or two from now. If I'm heading back for work, I might have to get the shot in the States. Well, that's uh, and that's exactly what I was actually going to go to next. So you guys, I was taking a look and uh, and maybe the online stuff doesn't represent you. you you're going to have more accurate data on where you guys are going to go. But from what I saw online, it looks like you guys have uh, America dates. And it's Jerry Beckley from America uh, talking to us about keeping the light on the best of Jerry Beckley. And so it looks like you guys have America dates that start this summer and from what i saw and forgive me jerry if it's out of date or wrong i thought i saw london was when where you were going to start it well it didn't start in london um we actually have something in june still on the calendar and that's uh the moment it still exists but the majority not the majority a big chunk of the summer is europe um i think it was going to start in dublin Okay. But, you know, it was morphing as we spoke. There was there was London gig and there was a, a festival called the Cornberry Festival. Shows in France, Italy, um, Germany, Sweden, which we hadn't played ever. And I think there's even an Iceland date. Now, obviously, Glastonbury was just punted a few weeks ago and stuff. The whole that dynamic is an unfortunate. There's a business element to this, because let's say that there were 10 shows on a European tour. If three or four of them fall out, you might be in a, a difficult situation because a lot of times the finances of these things depend on everything happening. And if you pull out a half of the shows, then all of a sudden the airfares and things start to become cost prohibitive. So um, I'm going to leave that to a smarter minds than myself. And Dewey and I have vowed to go out and do what we can when we can. But uh, there's going to be a certain amount of decisions that have to be made regardless.
Right. And so those shows are still on the books, huh? And does that mean, Jerry, that uh, at least, I guess Europe might be different than America, but you'll be able to explain it. Does that mean these concerts are going to be scaled back, sort of like how we were talking about, where they would sell less tickets, basically like a third of the house kind of deal to provide social distancing? Or are these concerts that you're scheduled for scheduled to sell all the tickets in these houses? Well, it's different. Each show is different. Show, for example, the Cornberry Festival is an outdoor festival. And so one of their kind of not their ace up the sleeve, but one of their benefits is because it's outdoor, it's a lot easier for them to just spread everybody out and and try and put some social distancing. But the unfortunate reality of 90 some percent of all the music business and touring is a numbers game. And the promoters who are excellent at what they're doing and all the acts, the, the big acts of the world that go out and do this, if not yearly, every other, it's based on capacity and ticket price and all of these equations. And the minute you cut capacity in half or God forbid a quarter, um, you've, you've uh, cut the guarantees down. That minute. So it, it's not as simple as, well, let's just do it for, for good old time's sake and get everybody out there. It has to work for all of the people the, the, what they call the margins, the margins in big time concerts, you know, stadium acts and arenas and stuff are so slim. Promoters basically have to sell every seat right. in order to pay the guarantees that a lot of these major acts demand. I'm not lumping myself in that group, but I just know the dynamics of how this works. And it's uh, causing everybody to reassess this. And there's a lot of people that say, well, I can't, can't take the machine out, can't take the band out for half of what, you know, so, um, you know, that's all in our case to be determined. Uh, everything that we have basically has is gigs that have been postponed from last year. They all got pushed, you know, because these deals were all in place. Right. So they're not yeah. reduced. They're not reduced capacity. They're no. not They're not reduced guarantees. Yeah. I've, we've heard this rap from a bunch of cats who, and it's great to hear it from you though, too, because each, each of you have a little bit more that you explain um, for yeah. our, our audience about it. But some artists have told us they are going to be taking lower guarantees in the future to make it work um, because of like- well, that, That's inevitable, unfortunately, but exactly what, what that means, you know, is that just not going to 10% off the top, or is it, you know, some serious recalculation, recal everything about a touring entity, meaning, you know, um, you go out with a 15 person crew, you've got double the costs of some band that goes out with a seven person crew. It's just simple math. Yeah. There's a hotel, there's a flight for everybody. These things all have to fit into some kind of framework. I was reading an interesting developing story in Europe, which was, which Tom York was kind of the spokesperson for this because Radiohead is one of those mammoth bands that goes out every year and performs at some of the most fantastic functions, you know, and festivals all over the world, frankly, but certainly in Europe. And their dilemma, it was almost like it had nothing to do with COVID. Their dilemma was all Brexit based, that mm. because the UK was no longer part of the European Union, the freedoms that had been allowed to travel inter country with visas and, you know, passports being accepted is now completely different. So there's a guy fighting two battles because, you know, he's an English band based in the UK that wants to go out and do what they always do. And they've got a Brexit hurdle, it's clear, right. even before they um, deal with COVID. That's so fascinating. I hadn't even thought of that. And um, and when uh, it's funny because we were talking a little bit about England and you were just mentioning it, mentioning it there. Um, and when you scroll all the way back to your history, of course, starting in the UK, you guys were children of service members who were based over there. You came together and began the band. Your first ever gig, and, and correct me if I've got this wrong, I took it from Wikipedia, and I'm hoping they're right because I donated to them to help keep them running. Uh, it says, December 20th, 1970, the Roundhouse in London, opening act for The Who, Elton John. It was a Christmas charity event with the Salvation Army. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I, I remember it very well. Now, I, I don't want to rain too heavily on that parade. <laughs> I mean, that, cer that certainly did happen, but it was not the first show. We had played... Um, a variety of pubs and okay. little things. For the, I guess for the they call it the first major one is how I think. Yeah, well, that, that is true. And that's true. And and not not long after that, um, we played the same venue, the Roundhouse. And this was Dewey, Dan, and I on stools doing about 20, 30 minutes of what was basically half of our the first album. But we opened for Pink Floyd. <laughs> so we did our 30 minutes of acoustic 
And then they came out with a 90 piece orchestra and choir and played Adam Hart and Mother, you know, their new album yeah. from start to finish. Jesus Christ, amazing. Wow. And so, yeah, we had some really amazing. Then a few months later, we were at the, at the Oval Cricket Ground in Wembley um, with The Who and The Faces. Uh, Rod and the Faces. And I think by that time I knew Ronnie quite well, Ronnie Wood. And so, uh, you know, these, for an 18 year old kid, 17 and 18 years old, you can imagine our eyes were pretty wide. Oh, I can imagine. And the same with the Who. Did you get any reaction from. Uh, from yeah. No, well, not, not from them. I mean, they don't, they had no idea whoever we were that was playing two hours before, you know, um, they were even on. But within a few months, I knew Keith Moon quite well because Harry Nielsen was a dear friend of mine, and Harry was very close with Keith. And their their um, their kind of annex annex were are legendary. You know, these guys were just on the town every night. So, got to know him. And I, I to be honest, if I'd have mentioned to him, do you have any idea that we've gigged with you twice? I don't think he would have known. Right. <laughs> yeah. And you're right. You point out the very big truth, which is a lot of the time when these bands, they're, but they don't get a chance to see each, see each other. And when you're opening, you're at a different point in your career. And you're this insignificant thing that they wouldn't even have, uh, have thought of necessarily. Yeah. We had a, we had a singer songwriter one time when we were, when we were, yeah, I don't know, it's late seventies or something and played, uh, named Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I missed it. You know, and I'd heard, oh, I think this guy signed to, signed to CBS. He's, he's going to be the next big thing, which, of course, he was. But I still didn't get me to the gig early enough to watch. So funny. He opened for you guys. Yeah. That is two, for, just for one gig or a, or a tour? Oh, just one, I think. I, I don't know. Unbelievable. Any other crazy ones like that in your, uh, any incongruous ones, too, that just seem strange? Like, you never opened for Sabbath, did you? <laughs> no, we didn't open for Sabbath, but Floyd is pretty good. We, we played on a lot of festivals with, you know, unbelievable lineups and stuff. But as you might know, our particular journey was a, a rocket ship of its own. We we put the album out in 71 and it was number one and horse was number one around the world by 72. So it was like, I, don't know, I, I always say it was kind of about a 10 year thing when before the smoke cleared and you look around and go, God, Oh, I bet. We're, it's incredible. We're still, I'm sure you're pinching yourself every day. You've done so well with your life, and uh, and have uh, it's just great that you're still healthy and doing all the things that you that you have. Um, and did you ever do Royal Albert Hall or Ronnie Scott's in London? No, but you know that's that's a great. We haven't ever played the Albert Hall. Beach Boys were scheduled recently. That they're supposed to do Albert Hall in June, and I think that's going away. I think that's a casualty of COVID. But we always had a joke about you saying, you know, the Albert Hall. Yeah, yeah. Well, right next door is the Imperial College. And we've played there <laughs> two or three times. So um, never played the Albert Hall. But we have just a couple of years ago finally played the London Palladium, which is an iconic London venue. And we had the foresight, I'd like to say it was our idea, but a crew came in and filmed it. And it became a DVD or a live concert, then, which is going to come out, I think, on public um, television yeah and that's the and, thing that's on your website it's recorded in november of 2018 I yeah think it was. and man we got you know you never know from night to night and we had just been doing a, a whole tour of uh, europe and stuff but went really well turned into a fantastic just really great and again an honor to play the, the famous london palladium Oh, that's great. That's good stuff. Well, as we go to wrap it up, uh, I was also curious if uh, I'm going to name a couple of these uh, recent guests that have joined you, have preceded you, I guess was the proper word, right before your segment, and just see if you've ever had any interaction or toured or just anything sure. with them. Uh, Jethro Tull. Yeah, we gigged with Jethro Tull, um, and, but not back when you would have thought. You know, they were, that whole Aqualung area was era was right when we were in England and, you know, fantastic memories. I think I might have seen them at the Roundhouse, but many, many years later, like um, in the 90s, I think we did a gig with them. Oh, wow. And uh, there there he was, Ian Anderson. He's a, he's a grown man now with short hair and stuff. It's kind of like looking at Robert Tripp and you're going, <laughs> same guy from King Crimson. <laughs> How about Herb Alpert? I've met Herb quite a few times. I used to live up in the in L.A., up in the hills, and he has a or had a fantastic restaurant up at the top of Beverly Glen. Um, that 
I'd just like to say that what they did, him and um, Herb Alpert and uh, Moss, Jerry, Jerry. Jerry Moss, part, yeah, in, in uh, A&M, was we were not we we were very well taken care of with the Warner Brothers, you know that they, that was a fantastic home to be. But I think what A and M and Herb did for that label and that roster of acts is also really deserves a round of applause because it was really an artist focused thing and it redefined the industry. And so that guy was so much more than just a you know trumpet player. Oh yeah, totally. He's epic. He's and he's he's a great. Uh... He's got huge connections here too, as you can imagine. He has a house right here. Yeah, I think he's got a he's got a place there. Yep, he does. And uh, John Densmore, The Doors. Um, well, I know him. I've no, I've met him. I don't know him well. Um, I know Robbie Krieger a little bit. These guys are, of course, all close with Henry Diltz. Right, like, uh, you know, right. It's so funny all your connections. And you mentioned Cameron Crowe. His ex, his ex wife has been on the show too. Uh, Nancy Wilson. Uh, Nancy, of course, sure. Yeah. Well, you see, Hollywood, small town. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, that's a figure. You know you know all the cats. And uh, so, okay, so you get to pick the song we go out on, young man. And um, perhaps you've got one on here that has a little story that goes along with it, or if you think about it. Well, let's, let's go with the title track, because there's a reason, uh, rather than just Cameron, like this song. Um, it, you know, I've been recording, as you know, millions of years and hundreds of songs, but on occasion things come together. And this is one of those tunes I think just makes some sense. It's about a, a, a relationship in ups and downs and things, but I think the message goes a little deeper. And so I'll pick that one. Keeping the light on, as we've been talking with uh, Jerry Beckley, of course, of the band America, and he's got this new best of Keeping the Light On and uh, still... Still in Sydney, and at the moment, the plan is when are when will you be heading out of there? What's at the moment? Just tentatively, what is the plan? Uh, tentatively, I think I'm coming back uh, the start of June, late May or the start of June. All right. Well, fingers crossed that it all works out, and uh, we we don't have obviously we don't have any shows coming here yet, um, and uh -huh. and it's probably going to be a while, but we're obviously rooting for a lot of success, and hopefully that works and. Uh, I hope you had fun today. It was a lot of fun to have you back on the show, uh, my brother. Always good to talk with you, and please say hi to everybody in paradise there, okay? Aloha, everyone. It's Jerry Beckley here from the group America. It's great to be back at HPR. You know, we've got a lot of connections here in Hawaii, and one of them is Hawaii Public Radio. I've been a guest many times with our friend Dave Lawrence and was just part of Dave's Off the Road series. But folks, let's get serious here. None of it would be possible without your support. Listeners become members, and we're hoping you'll become one now. Here's how, and a big mahalo. You're an animal. I think you've done these a few times over the years. <laughs> You're an animal. I think you've done these. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to you. All right, cuz. Man, it was great talking uh, to you. Do give Dewey yeah. my best. Tell him we said I hi. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Nice to hear your voice. You too. Stay safe. Aloha. Ow.